Hey guys, today I'll show you a science fiction thriller TV series named C, Season 2. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama begins on the border of the Trivant Kingdom during winter. A patrol squad marches forward through the territory, their footsteps crunching in the silent chill. Suddenly the team leader halts, sensing something amiss. Swords are drawn in an instant, ready for defense. With a snap of his fingers, the leader signals the stranger to approach for inspection. But the stranger, Voss, thrusts a blade straight through the leader's throat. Alarmed by the sound, the others whirl around to face the assailant. Voss moves with such agility that not a single blow lands on him. His acute hearing guides him past a sweeping tackle. With a breath, Voss zeroes in on the source of the attack. In a brutal collision, he severs the attacker's leg. The fights among the blind are simple, yet brutal. Each move is fierce and decisive. Voss's son, Kofun, manages to hold his own, though the intense combat takes its toll. An enemy, not yet dead, rises to retaliate. In the nick of time, Voss grabs the survivor, wrenches the dagger from his grasp, and carves a piece of flesh from the man's body. The scene is too gruesome for Kofun to watch. Voss summons his son, teaching him hands-on how to deliver a fatal blow, to feel the bone shatter, the muscle tear. At that moment, the top censor among the group, Paris, calls out to Voss, pointing out that the fallen leader's clothes are still intact, perfect for a disguise for them to infiltrate the Trivent Kingdom. After making preparations, Voss instructs them to wait for him. He'll proceed alone. Anxious, Kofun believes his sight could be of help to his father. But Voss's response is a swift punch, a lesson that even with sight, a strong, blind warrior is not easily bested. His wish is for his son to grow up strong, but things aren't going as planned. To honor his wife Magra's last wish, he doesn't want his son to risk the perilous journey because the place he's heading to is fraught with danger. He asks them to wait here for seven days. If he doesn't return by then, it means both he and Haniwa have perished. In that event, Paris is to take Kofun and flee as far as possible. Meanwhile, Queen Cain and her sister Magra at their Payan kingdom were leading their army on a grand march. Given the considerable distance to Jerlamaral's base, the queen decided to station her forces in Pensa City, a satellite city of the Payan kingdom. The queen's arrival was met with a rapturous welcome from its people. To them, it was an immense honor to have the nation's most exalted royalty grace their city. Assisted by her soldiers, the queen dismounted with dignity and made her way to the central building of the city. Lord Harlan immediately knelt and bowed his head in fealty to welcome the queen. Queen Kane skillfully employed her usual tactics. She began with a passionate preamble before announcing that henceforth, Pensa City would be the capital. The honor of elevating the city to capital status naturally thrilled the citizens, who expressed their joy by pounding the ground in celebration. Seizing the moment, the queen tearfully revealed the truth about the destruction of the Kanzua Dam where their palace resided. Through her narrative, the populace learned that it was their rival kingdom Trivant who had attacked their palace, and the reason for it all was the child in the queen's womb, a child of destiny born with the gift of sight. This news set off a buzz among the crowd. In the kingdom of Payan, possessing sight was heretical, and decades of suppression had deeply ingrained this law. Now, the queen carrying such a child seemed to be defying the will of God. However, she proclaimed this to be God's design, claiming the heretical power had been cleansed. God had chosen to bestow this power upon her to reshape the world. Henceforth, the nation would have an army with sight. She claimed that Trivant's invasion was born out of fear of a strengthened nation. After the queen's bewildering speech, the people accepted those with sight would no longer be deemed heretics, and Trivant had become their sworn enemy, accountable for the lives lost in the flood, which was actually caused by the queen herself. After the speech, Lord Harlan let out a laugh and departed. Magra felt a growing unease, fearing the lies her sister continued to weave would eventually doom them. That very day, Magra confronted the queen with her concerns. The queen told her that it was not only about maintaining authority, but also about providing an explanation to the people. Moreover, she carried the child of the sighted man, Boots, which meant possessing a godlike vision, an opportunity she had long coveted. She intended to use this power to consolidate her rule. On the other side, Lord Harlan was being teased by his own brother. The Queen's arrival not only took over Harlan's residence, but also diminished his authority in Pensa City. Harlan believed this was all temporary because based on his understanding of the Queen, the incident at the Kanzua Dam was far from straightforward. He simply couldn't believe that the technologically advanced kingdom of Trivant would initiate an attack. To find the truth, Harlan first approached the matter with the military commander to test the waters. 
He asked the queen to recount the details of the enemy's attack. With just a few words, the queen dismissed their suspicions. At that moment, Magra stepped in to smooth things over, suggesting they dispatch a patrol to search for her family. She realized that her children, Kofun and Haniwa, born with the gift of sight, no longer needed to hide from the witch hunters. Undeterred, Harlan sought out Magra that night, handing her a tuning fork she had cherished in her childhood. From their conversation, it became clear they had known each other since they were young. Sensing Magra's joy, Harlan brought up the Kanzua Dam incident again. But Magra flatly refused to discuss it, even warning Harlan that doubting the queen could mean losing his head. Harlan smiled and reluctantly left, while Magra was well aware that she and her queen sister were now in this together, and no one should let slip any information. The scene shifts back to the Trivant border, where the army discovered a patrol massacred by Voss. The leading officer, after examining the wounds, immediately guessed the culprit was Voss. Voss was now sitting in the wilderness, carefully smearing mud on his face to deceive the guard's sense of smell. Soon, he arrived at the city checkpoint, where he was asked to present his identity cord. Voss, familiar with the place, casually matched the password. The other side was suspicious and sniffed around, but finding no issues, they eventually let him pass. After an arduous journey, Voss finally returned to his homeland after 25 years, a place he had not seen since leaving. Despite the years, the familiar scenes and scents were unforgettable to him. As the camera pans, the legendary steel city of Trivant comes into view, a city from the 21st century where people, having lost all vision, continue to live resiliently. Voss, guided by his memory and perception, follows the guide ropes forward until he hears a melodious song that confirms his destination. Passing through a large archway, he turns into Trivant's weapon forge, where an old friend resides. Dropping his gear, Voss strikes up a conversation on the pretense of selling weapons. Upon hearing the familiar voice, the old friend recognizes him as Voss, long thought lost. After a brief embrace, he leads Voss to a place where they can talk. Voss got straight to the point. He asked his old friend to find out the whereabouts of his daughter. Upon hearing his request, the friend understood the situation. As they conversed, a hidden past surfaced. It turns out that 25 years ago, Voss underwent a drastic change in temperament here. After killing most of his family, including his own father, he fled away. His surviving brother, Edo, yearning for revenge for their father's death, built up an army and became the commander while persistently searching for Voss's trace. After 25 long years, an opportunity arose when Ehdo learned of Voss's children's whereabouts from Gerlamorel, inadvertently luring Voss out. Aware of the danger he was in, Voss was determined to save his daughter Haniwa. His friend admired Voss's courage and informed him that the prison was now heavily guarded, making a rescue almost impossible. He advised Voss to abandon the idea. However, Voss coaxed his friend into revealing a way. The iron door creaked open and Haniwa covered her head in terror. The newcomer moved quietly and was clearly a woman. Haniwa climbed onto the bed, curling up in fear of what harm the woman might bring. However, the woman had no ill intentions. She skillfully prepared some food and brought it to Haniwa, who was unappreciative and tried to find out the woman's true purpose. The woman told Haniwa that all of this was to bait Voss, not only the commander's brother, but also the man who killed his own father. The commander, Edo, lured him here to avenge their father's death. Haniwa couldn't believe what she heard. The woman said no more and stood up to leave. However, Haniwa posed another question and threw something at the woman who caught it immediately. As a result, Haniwa deduced the woman had the gift of sight like her. Haniwa questioned why she hid it. Then the woman revealed her name was Ren. To avoid being discovered and ostracized from a young age, she pretended to be blind for over a decade. But obviously, she was not one of Gerla Morel's children. Indeed, both her parents were blind. Like Gerla Morel, she was a rare inheritor of sight. Haniwa listened to Ren's story, a wave of sympathy rising within her. How lonely it must be to have sight in a world full of blind people. Yet in the next moment, she threatened Ren, saying she could reveal her secret to the commander at any time, so it would be best to release her. But Ren rushed towards Haniwa with a knife, warning her that if she dared to speak again, she would take her life instantly. Meanwhile, with the aid of his old friend, Voss found a craftsman. After navigating through level after level of stairs, they finally arrived at the Steel Forge's furnace room, where the fierce blaze made the air hot. Soon, they were confronted by a narrow tunnel. According to the craftsman, passing through it would lead them to the top of the prison. For his daughter, Voss was willing to risk everything. Facing the scorching pipes, he didn't hesitate to crawl inside. As soon as he stepped in, the scalding heat enveloped him, the hot air nearly searing his lungs. 
Despite this, Voss did not retreat. The further he went, the narrower the passage became until he had to lie flat, inching forward on his elbows and knees. With each passing second, his endurance was tested to its limits. Just when he felt he couldn't bear it any longer, he finally reached the area just below the exit. He braced against the wall and climbed up. But as he moved the manhole cover aside, he found the enemy had been waiting for a long time. Clearly, the craftsman who had led the way had betrayed him. Voss didn't rage, but laughed instead, as it seemed he would have to add a few more lives to his toll. He grabbed the traitorous craftsman and threw him into the pipe like an adult toy. An enemy struck with a club, but Voss rose in pain and counterattacked, seizing a weapon and delivering a retaliatory strike. Those who were not afraid to die continued to advance, and Voss swiftly dispatched them with a few punches and kicks. As more soldiers arrived, Voss lifted a table to temporarily fend off their assault. He then seized the moment to break out, knocking down a soldier who was coming straight at him, and then, with brute force, snapping his neck. More enemies were closing in, but Voss wielded a soldier's short knife and entered a frenzied killing spree, slashing each one. In just a few seconds, he had left none of the enemies before him standing. Just as he was preparing to flee the battlefield, a youthful voice rang out saying that he's on the left and running towards the square. Voss realized there was someone with sight present, which complicated matters. The young boy continued to observe and shout, constantly reporting Voss's position. As the boy descended the stairs, he was caught by Voss, who forced the boy back and moved towards the corner, hushing him to quiet down. Just as he turned to leave, the little boy immediately reported his location again, causing Voss immense pain. More enemies were closing in, and Voss could only fend them off wearily. His sluggish movements suggested he was starting to run out of strength. After taking down two soldiers, he was finally ensnared in a steel wire net. Voss had at last been captured. In the prison of Trivant, Voss was securely chained. Approaching him was a man, none other than the commander-in-chief of the Kingdom of Trivent, and Voss's own brother, Edo. The long scar on his head was proof of his combat prowess, no less than Voss's. At that moment, he was mocking his brother for not having killed the child, which had led to his downfall. Voss paid no attention to his brother's jibes, only repeatedly pleading with him to spare his daughter, but his brother was clearly indifferent. After decades of harbored resentment, an apology could not resolve the conflict. At Edo's command, a burly man approached. Meanwhile, at the Trivant border, Paris was praying beside a bonfire, asking for protection when she suddenly sensed someone approaching. The newcomer, Toad, was leading a squad of witch hunters. As he was about to continue questioning, Kofun arrived just in time. He grabbed Paris, intending to flee. However, they hadn't gone far before they were caught by the witch hunters. As they considered returning the way they came, Toad appeared again and questioned their identities. He pulled Paris away and began to search Kofun. The experienced Toad could determine Kofun's identity with just his smell and touch. Paris tried to defend Kofun, but Toad stopped her, stating it was Princess Magra's orders to bring the two children back to the city of Pensa. Confused, Kofun wondered if his mother was still alive. To confirm the truth of his claim, Paris felt Toad, and her strong sense of touch led her to conclude that everything he said was true. An excited Paris ran to Kofun, sharing the incredible news. Toad ordered his men to set off immediately to report back. Due to the seven-day agreement with Voss, Kofun was reluctant to leave. But Toad told him that this was the border of Trivant, where brutal patrol squads were constantly passing by, making it dangerous to stay. For safety, Paris allowed Kofun to go meet his mother while she stayed behind to wait for Voss. In the next scene, Voss had been whipped for three days. At that moment, his brother approached, forcefully clutched at his wounds, and took in the scent of blood, revitalizing his consciousness. Despite Voss's immense suffering, it could never quench his hatred for the massacre of his family. Edo could never forgive Voss for the bloodshed among their people and the murder of their own father. Voss was acutely aware of his brother's cruelty, and with his dying strength, he begged Edo to spare his daughter. However, Edo coldly informed him that not only would he have to endure unimaginable agony, but his daughter would also share in this endless torture. Meanwhile, Ren entered the room to find Haniwa missing. In her moment of confusion, she was suddenly held at knife point by Haniwa. Undaunted, Ren pushed back, breaking free and seizing Haniwa, disarming her knife and sending her crashing to the ground. Ren quickly gained the upper hand. The fight between the two women was intense and physical, their chicken strength rivaling that of any man's. After a desperate lunge, Ren cleverly dodged, but it allowed Haniwa to arm herself. The next second's attack brought Ren to the ground, but Haniwa pounced, gaining control. Gazing upon someone whose fate echoed her own, Haniwa's resolve softened. 
A battle for their lives induced a subtle shift in their relationship. In the chilling twilight of winter, the trio escorting Kofun paused to rest. Following the lead of Toad, Kofun struck up a conversation with him, learning that Toad was a seasoned member of the witch-hunting army for many years. By the riverbank, Kofun challenged Toad, questioning why they pursued those with sight. Toad explained that those with sight could operate machines, which they would use to destroy the world, and that millions had perished by such machines. This act was deemed witchcraft by the state. Kofun countered, questioning why they had to slaughter Alkeni village. Was it necessary that everyone be buried for one witch, who truly was the one killing innocents and destroying the world? Kofun's piercing questions plunged Toad into deep thought. That night, two stealthy figures emerged in the woods, with their target confirmed. One of them lifted a rock, but Kofun startled awake, quickly dodged to the side. They turned out to be soldiers from the witch-hunting squad. Despite the Queen's new decree, they couldn't accept the reality. They still firmly believed that those with sight were witches. Toad arrived, scolded his men, and ordered them to return to the ranks immediately. However, the soldiers had lost their reason. In the ensuing scuffle, Toad accidentally killed one of them. Sensing his comrade's death, the other soldier retreated from the fight, commandeered a Ferrari horse, and fled. The next day, only Toad and Kofun remained of the witch-hunting squad. Kofun expressed gratitude for Toad saving his life, but Toad simply replied he had no choice because Kofun was Magra's son. Back in the bustling city of Pensa, the solemn National Assembly was in session. The scribe was ready, prepared to record the proceedings. At this moment, the queen began to issue commands. She ordered the sergeant major to organize troops for war. However, her proposal was met with opposition, as it was completely against the rules and procedures of warfare. Just as the queen was about to erupt in anger, her sister Magra stepped forward to mediate. With the capital newly established and public sentiment unstable, she argued that it was necessary to first consolidate the military and fortify defenses before making any further plans. The queen felt insulted by this advice and let out an angry roar like a goose, bringing the farcical meeting to an abrupt end. Once everyone had dispersed, the queen took her frustration out on her sister. Opposition from the assembly and her own sister's instigation left her questioning her ability to rule. Yet Magra contended that war equaled suicide. The nations of Payan and Trivant were not on the same level. To think of defeating Trivant was sheer folly. She couldn't fathom where her sister's confidence came from and questioned how many more lies and sacrifices it would take before it would end. The queen did not answer, but confidently claimed that everything was God's plan, that her many trials had not harmed her in the slightest, but on the contrary, proved to be a miracle. Magra was speechless. She approached her sister, pleading for her to see sense. However, the queen spoke of matters concerning the textile factory, warning Magra not to forget the reality of their joint usurpation of power with the witch hunter general. Stunned by her words, Magra froze. While the sisters argued, they were unaware that there was another person in the meeting room. Lord Harlan had not left after the assembly concluded and had heard the entire conversation, which reinforced his suspicions about the Kanzua Dam incident. Elsewhere, Haniwa and Ren bonded after the fight. Both having never met someone similar before, loneliness drew them closer. One day, Ren came to Haniwa, unlocked the shackles on her feet, and then left the cell. She wanted to take Haniwa to a place that would amaze her. The immense kingdom of Trivant was unlike the theocratic rule of the Payan dynasty. Trivant, with its strong industrial presence, was a mirror of an ancient civilization. The streets were bustling with activity, thronged with people. Even though they were all blind, everyone went about their work, trade, and entertainment in an orderly fashion. As they passed by a stall, they couldn't help but pause in awe. It was a program where stories were performed through the art of voice, and although it was merely spoken, it felt incredibly vivid, as if they were truly part of the scene. Leaving the center of the bustling street behind, they turned into a neighborhood. The place Ren wanted to share with Haniwa was this dilapidated building. After what seemed like countless flights of stairs, they arrived at a corridor. Ren retrieved a key and opened the door to a familiar room. Upon entering, Haniwa was astounded. The room housed not only a piano, but also a vast collection of books and mysterious objects whose names she could not guess. She walked around and then stopped in front of a window. For the first time, she looked down upon the buildings of their ancestors and was simply taken aback by the grandeur. Ren explained that they were very high up, a place only someone with sight like hers could reach. Here, she would feel safe and at ease. Finally, they reached a bedroom where Ren picked up an illustrated book, one of her favorites. 
However, Ren couldn't read. She enjoyed books purely through imagination. Haniwa told her the book's title and then proceeded to narrate the story to her. Ren was captivated by Haniwa's longing for knowledge, which she had harbored for many years. After the story, Ren took out a necklace engraved with words and called Haniwa over to ask what the inscription meant. Haniwa informed her it read, Eternity. Ren mused that perhaps only love could be eternal. And with that, Haniwa kissed Ren. Meanwhile, Voss was enduring his fourth day of whipping, now thrown into the dungeons of Trivant. It wasn't his brother's mercy that had brought him here, but rather because Voss was close to being beaten to death. Even as the soldiers left, after their beating and mocking, a familiar voice came from the cell next door. The figure brought over a cup of water, fumbling to place it in the center. The camera slowly panned up to reveal none other than June, the witch hunter general of the Paian kingdom, the very enemy that had troubled Voss for years, now unexpectedly showing up here. Voss forced himself to stand, calling out June's name with effort. He despised this enemy who had killed his beloved wife and had led to the tragic fate of his two children. However, June told him that Magra was not dead because she was the princess of Payan, the queen's sister. Voss naturally refused to believe such absurd bullshits, especially after being hunted by this man for 17 years. June urged Voss to calm down and think it through. They were now both felons of the kingdom and there was no need for him to lie about this. In his life, he had never lied. Compared to Voss, Haniwa was enjoying her freedom. In just a few short days, her relationship with Ren had developed rapidly. One day, as they passed by the barracks, Haniwa noticed a boy with sight, and to her amazement, he was directing blind soldiers in drill and combat. Back in the confinement room, Haniwa asked whose child that was. Upon learning that the boy had been bought from Gerlamorel by the commander, Haniwa was furious and denounced Gerlamorel as scum. Just then, Edo arrived. Ren turned to greet him and asked him what brought him there. Edo told her that Haniwa's time was up. The next day, Edo came to Haniwa, who's tied up beside him. He squatted down and said he's not her uncle. After expressing these words, Edo groped his way out. Meanwhile, the very soldier who was meant to mate with Haniwa entered the room. At the same time, Ren was frantic with worry. After much consideration, she decided to take a risk. In the quiet dungeons of Trivant, Ren approached stealthily on tiptoe. Just as the two guards became aware of her, she executed a fluid sequence of moves that swiftly dispatched them. It turns out, Ren had come to save Voss because she knew it was the only way to save Haniwa. Upon opening the cell, Ren woke up Voss, explained her intentions, and prepared to leave with him. At that moment, June intervened, pleading to be taken along. Despite his doubts, Voss, thinking of the hope that his wife might still be alive and the need for assistance in rescuing his daughter, decided to give it a try. With that in mind, Voss allowed Ren to release June. Voss deduced from her footsteps that Ren had sight. Ren admitted it and distributed weapons to everyone. The prison was heavily guarded and securely locked down, but these obstacles were no match for them. June took out archers from above while Voss and Ren cleared obstacles below. After defeating the enemy, Voss found a bow and told Ren to keep it for Haniwa. With Ren leading the way, they arrived at the place where Haniwa was being held. Ren went to find more people while Voss stayed to eliminate any potential threats. On the other side, Haniwa, having been tormented, was on the brink of collapse. Just as the man was about to have a baby with her, Ren arrived just in time. Holding the limp Haniwa in her arms, Haniwa was saved, but Voss faced a formidable enemy. With his hands searching, he quickly dispatched a soldier. But in the next instant, he sensed grave danger. His brother Edo was upon him. Edo grabbed Voss and slammed him against the wall, unleashing a furious assault. Voss was at the end of his tether, depleted of all strength. He did not fight back, instead enduring Edo's brutal beatings. Edo even held a knife to his brother's throat as a final threat, yet Voss did not resist. Instead, he asked him to kill him and put an end to this. Hearing this, Edo sat stunned on the ground. The hatred of decades had grown into a towering tree in his heart. How could he possibly let his brother off so easily? Edo furiously declared that he wanted Haniwa to spend the rest of her life in the dungeon, to be the nation's breeding machine until her womb ceased to function, and then to chop her up and throw her into the dung pit. At this critical moment, Haniwa's voice rang out. Seeing her oppressed father, she released an arrow, swiftly followed by a second and a third. Haniwa's attack turned the tide. Voss finally saw his daughter. There was no time for reunions as Haniwa picked up a weapon and told her father they needed to leave immediately. However, Voss approached his brother, knife at Edo's throat, warning him to never come near his child again, or he would burn the city to the ground. 
Edo roared like a goose in defiance. Once Voss and Haniwa had left, Edo sounded the citywide alarm. A piercing whistle sounded, and a great number of soldiers swarmed out. Haniwa and her father made their way to the city gate. They had to clear out the soldiers there, or it would be very troublesome. Though Voss was exhausted, dispatching a few soldiers was still as easy as slicing pieces of shit. Ren charged to the front and stabbed the last gatekeeper. Haniwa pleaded with Ren to leave with them, but it was not to be. Ren took out the gemstone engraved with the word Eternity, kissed Haniwa goodbye, and turned to face the incoming soldiers. With a heavy heart, Haniwa let go. Watching the woman she loved disappear into the distance, Ren was overwhelmed with emotion. Glancing at the approaching soldiers, she did not hesitate to remove the gate bar. The scene shifts to Gerlamorel, the man who happens to bear vision in a world of the blind. Upon discovering that he alone has the ability to see, he starts to voraciously read books and study knowledge, flirting with girls around the world and thus acquiring a multitude of offspring. After decades of planning and waiting, he finally builds an impregnable new kingdom. However, he crosses paths with Voss, who gouges out his eyes for punishment and causes him to lose his ability to see. After struggling through a period of darkness, Gerlamarl sees a glimmer of hope for regaining his sight. The moment arrives when the blind doctor unwraps the bandages. Beside him, his son is brimming with anticipation. Once the last procedure is complete, the doctor asks Gerla Morel to open his eyes and try to see. But in the end, he still can't see anything. It's clear that they have exhausted all options, and at this moment, it seems that Gerla Morel's grand plan is doomed to failure. Gerla Morel cries out, saying that he cannot become blind. Meanwhile, in the Trivent Council Hall, the high levels of the kingdom gather. They operate under a republic, with the ruling power composed of representatives of the people, finance, and military, thus also known as the Triangular Council, jointly governing the country and deciding everything. And at that moment, Edo, standing in the center, is facing the council's onslaught. Firstly, they blame Edo for not executing Voss in time, leading to the death of many innocent soldiers. It's also evident that the heavily guarded Trivant must have an insider. Secondly, it's not just Voss who has escaped, but also June of the Payan Kingdom. The importance of this general begins with the latest intelligence. The Queen of Payan has issued a decree to abolish witch hunting and promotes the next generation with sight, and the key accusation is that Trivon attacked their capital. Various signs indicate that the Payan Kingdom is shifting strategy and seems intent on provoking war. Now June is a significant chess piece, and this piece has escaped. Thirdly, the Gannet people to the west of the kingdom have been increasingly rampant recently. The council demands that Edo focus his energy here. After the council's criticism, Edo taps the ground twice to indicate acceptance, and then exits the chamber. Edo inquired whether Ren had made any progress in the investigation. Ren hastily gave a few evasive replies. Back at his residence, Edo analyzed the entire incident. All signs pointed to the fact that it had to be someone with sight who helped Voss escape. He pondered over it and finally came to a conclusion. He stopped Ren and said he had figured out who it was. Hearing this, Ren couldn't help but feel a bit anxious. Meanwhile, at the House of Enlightenment, the blind Gerla Morel woke from a nightmare. His son hurried to comfort him, but Gerla Morel said waking up was the real nightmare because in his dreams, he could still see the flowers and the grass. Then he asked his son to continue poring over medical books to restore his sight sooner. However, it was all too late because Edo and his troops had already arrived in full force. When Edo and his men entered, Gerlamorel scrambled to his feet. Gerlamorel asked what the matter was. Edo told him that someone broke into his prison and freed Voss at top speed. Clearly, it must have been someone with sight. He suspected that it was another of Gerlamorel's children, Kofun. Gerlamorel explained that Kofun had been rescued by Voss. It was this statement that made Edo suspect Gerlamorel. The fact that Gerlamorel had sold Voss's daughter would have led Voss to tear him apart, yet here was Gerlamorel, unharmed. Seeing the situation turning grim, Gerlamorel's son tried to explain, which only made Edo more suspicious. Edo suddenly lunged at Gerlamorel, and after a quick search, he laughed. Gerlamorel argued that it was just a temporary injury, and that he would recover his eyesight quickly. With one strike, Gerla Morel was decapitated. Afterward, Edo warned Gerla Morel's son to think carefully about how to protect his family rather than seeking revenge for his father. After the incident, the Trivent took over the House of Enlightenment. Edo called in the scientists of Trivent and ordered Gerla Morel's son to work for him. The queen was deep in prayer when she was abruptly interrupted by a call. It was Lord Harlan coming to visit. Such an impolite act was clearly a sign that he had some leverage over the queen. 
Harlan got straight to the point, telling the queen that the only way to gain complete control over the economy and the army was to marry him. The queen laughed off Harlan's proposal, standing to question whether he had drunk too much. Harlan remained calm, reminding her of the mass protests from the ministers a few days ago. Harlan's words prompted the queen to reflect. Although it appeared she was in charge, she had not yet gained real control. The ministers and citizens of Pensa City were all voicing their opposition. Many were still questioning the destruction of the Kanzue Dam and the Queen's recent decree to abolish the law against those with sight. A shift in faith couldn't possibly lead to a complete change in public sentiment in such a short time, especially since the Payan Kingdom had been a theocracy for hundreds of years. From Harlan's words, it was evident that he merely wanted to use the Queen's status to secure his own position of power within the city. With this realization, the Queen decisively offered her sister Magra. Harlan considered it. Although it was less than ideal, he could accept it. But whether Magra would agree or not gave the queen a headache. She brushed it off and then lay down on her bed, asking Harlan to finish the prayer he had interrupted. Harlan happily complied. Meanwhile, under the lead of Haniwa, Voss and his followers arrived at the prearranged location with Paris. Voss felt the remnants of a burnt-out bonfire and concluded that Paris had already left. They moved on and soon came to a cliff. Based on the traces left on the scene, June expertly deduced what had happened. Three horses and two dogs had been there, and Kofun had also been taken from this spot. He guessed it was the witch hunters assigned by Magra, which meant Kofun should be safe. As Voss pondered, Haniwa discovered inscribed on the rocks was the name of Pensa City. Hearing that, June speculated that the queen must have usurped and made Pensa City the new capital. Meanwhile in Pensa, Boots rushed into the queen's room only to be shocked by the sight that greeted him. There sat the queen, sobbing uncontrollably, slumped on the ground with the body of the servant she had killed in her arms. It turned out that she had suffered a miscarriage. Boots tried to console her, assuring her that they could have more children someday. The queen embraced Boots and wept even harder like a giant baby. But in the next second, she quietly pulled out a weapon hidden in her wrist and killed Boots. Voss and his group encountered some robbers who stepped in their way. June had no intention of engaging in battle and attempted a few phrases of thieves' cant. The robbers seemed surprised upon hearing this, realizing they were not up against ordinary people and thus prepared to let them pass. However, the moment they noticed there were sexy women in the group, the fight was on. Haniwa, brandishing her bow, fought back fiercely. June leapt into action, but before he could execute a combo, a sudden blow to the back took him down, firmly subdued. Haniwa was similarly overpowered. Voss had no more strength left, but just then, a rope snared a robber's neck, and upon inspection, the enemy was found beheaded. Behind them stood three extraordinary women. What followed was not just astounding, but dazzling. Their silky strikes contributed to a relentless slaughter that carved out a brutal beauty. In just a brief moment, the battlefield was cleaned. This swift resolution left Haniwa in shock. Voss was about to ask who had come to their aid when a familiar voice spoke. It was Paris. After exchanging pleasantries rather than kisses, Paris sensed a great threat. On closer inspection, the danger came from their nemesis, June, who was right there among them. Hearing that another was the witch hunter general, the women quickly bound him up. Fortunately, after Voss's explanation, everyone's fears were eased. When things calmed down, Paris realized Voss was gravely injured, so Paris proposed they should rest for a few days before making further plans. In the city of Pensa, a shady deal was taking place. Harlan, having not received a response from the queen, had come knocking again. This time, he was ready to play his trump card, pressuring the queen to hasten the fulfillment of his request. The queen was about to stall Harlan with more words when he interrupted her. He insisted that the queen listen carefully because what was to follow was of great importance. With two claps of his hands, Harlan's brother entered the room with a soldier. Harlan began his questioning. It turned out the soldier was none other than the gatekeeper of the Kanzua Dam in the capital, whose family had served the Kane dynasty for generations. Not only was he familiar with the dam's structure, but he was also well-versed in the queen's modus operandi. As the queen abandoned her people and pulled the electrical switch, he had fled the scene in haste, ultimately surviving by luck. Now, it becomes clear that the Queen's claim of a trivant attack was nothing short of preposterous. It was a blatant attempt by the Queen to shift the blame. The Queen was shocked by that. She had never expected a survivor from the dam, and this spelled trouble. If this news spread, the military would surely revolt, and the Queen's fate would be the gallows. Sensing the Queen's fear, Harlan couldn't help but smirk. 
The next second, he drew a weapon and swiftly killed the soldier. Then, crouching down, he cut out the soldier's tongue before death had fully taken him. The queen couldn't fathom Harlan's intentions. In a daze, Harlan held the tongue in his hand and told the queen that no one could threaten her anymore, especially since she was the sister of his wife, Magra. It was this revelation that made the queen realize the importance of the pawn, Magra. Soon, Magra was facing the queen, who declared she had found her son, Kofun. Magra inquired about the whereabouts of Voss and Haniwa, to which the queen responded that there was no sign of them. Magra panicked. She knew her husband would never willingly leave their children unless something drastic had happened. Clearly, she was unaware of the events that had befallen her family over the past month, nor could she have known. Without time to think, the queen brought Magra back to the present, the arrival of Kofun. It was well known that he was sighted, and protecting Kofun was the immediate priority. Magra questioned why they should worry since the decree abolishing witch hunting had taken effect. After hearing this, the queen let out a sigh of sadness and began to cry like a giant baby. She disclosed to her sister that she had miscarried. Should the public learn of this, the reactionary cited would use it as leverage, rendering the decree ineffective. Thus, Kofun's existence would be in grave danger. Changing her tone, the queen continued with her bombshell. Harlan had found the destroyed dam's surviving soldier. Although the immediate threat was eliminated, she could not be sure there were no other survivors. The queen's alarming words left Magra's head spinning. She couldn't have imagined that in her attempt to save her family, she would find herself tied to her sister's schemes. Caught in a dilemma, to stay or flee was not a simple choice, and breaking this impasse seemed impossible. The queen sensed her sister's worry and proposed marrying her off to Harlan. Only through this union could they leverage Harlan's influence to steady the hearts of the people and control the military power. Magra was enraged upon hearing this, yet after reflection, what better plan was there? As the sun set behind the hills, Voss on the other side was settling down to rest in the camp. It was through Paris's stories that he learned about the events that had transpired since his departure. It turned out everything unfolded just as June had described. After Kafoon left, Paris encountered her own subordinates. Due to the danger at the border, they had brought Paris to safety here. It was revealed that the three women who had just rescued Voss were part of a secret tribe known as the Compass to which Paris belonged. As Paris's memories unfolded, a secret unknown to the world was revealed. Centuries ago, a minority of children in the Payan Kingdom were born with the gift of sight. To avoid detection by witch hunters, these mothers fled to the forests and spontaneously formed Compass, dedicated to protecting children with sight. This legacy was passed down from mother to daughter and continued to this day. However, only one boy ultimately survived, and Paris was directly responsible for him. By chance, Paris had broken the rules of Compass, allowing the boy to access books and the means to read them before it was time. The boy soon fled with the books. It turns out, Gerla Morel was that boy. As an adult, Gerla Morel impregnates girls far and wide, and one winter he entrusted the pregnant Magra to Paris's care, laying the groundwork for the children's future. For years, Paris kept silent, never revealing this to anyone, feeling guilty for allowing things to spiral out of the Compass's control. To make amends, she left the organization and accepted Gerla Morel's commission in Alkeni Village. That's why she encouraged Haniwa and Kofun to learn from books, including supporting their quest to find their biological father, Gerla Morel. All her actions were efforts to fulfill her duties as a guide. However, things didn't go as planned, and much was beyond her expectations. Haniwa was heartbroken upon hearing this. Her identity had failed everyone. The Paris who loved her had buried her hardships for so many years, which must have been incredibly hard. At that moment, she hugged Paris. No matter what, they all needed to take good care of each other. That evening, Haniwa snuggled beside her father and asked about the past that Edo had mentioned. Voss's memories, buried for 25 years, surfaced. It turned out that Voss's mother had died in childbirth with Edo. Their father blamed the death on Edo and thus demanded Voss to whip his brother from a young age. And one day, the father demanded Voss to kill his brother. At that moment, Voss erupted in rage. To protect Edo, he accidentally killed his own father and took all the blame upon his shoulders, though Edo remained unaware. In Edo's eyes, Voss was nothing but a beast who had whipped him as a child and then turned against his own kin as an adult. As Haniwa listened to her father's story, she finally understood. Voss had just ended Edo's kidnapping, and she had learned that her mother was a princess. Overwhelmed, Haniwa didn't know what to do next. On the other side, Toad and Kofun had returned to the city of Pensa, where the streets were eerily empty, almost devoid of pedestrians. 
Toad was puzzled, as this had never happened before. That's when Kofun told him that sentries stood at the gates. Toad hurried forward to inquire, perhaps a bit excited at the prospect of seeing his mother soon. However, Toad was shocked to know that Kofun's mother was getting married today. The scene shifts to Magra being adorned in fresh flowers, while Lord Harlan was decked in greenery, both receiving blessings from the Queen for their marriage. The whole venue burst into celebration, but Kofun was stunned, not knowing why his mother wanted to do this. Looking at the bustling crowd and his mother, who was all smiles, he couldn't believe this was actually happening. Led by Toad, Kofun arrived at Magra's residence. Hearing her son, Magra was both shocked and overjoyed. Mother and son embraced tightly, and all the longing and worry dissipated in that warm moment. Kofun asked why she was marrying another man. Magra said she would explain everything. She then asked about the whereabouts of Voss and Haniwa. Upon hearing they were in Trivant in a precarious situation, Magra could not afford to ponder too long because Harlan's call came from outside. Magra reiterated that she would explain everything later and begged her son not to ask any more questions, for it was all for the sake of their family, for everyone's safety. Finally, she kissed her son and reluctantly left, leaving Kofun in confusion. In a forest blanketed with snow, Voss ended his brief rest. The female comrade, stroking a knot map, informed everyone of the route to Pensa City. June approached and touched the map, estimating the journey to Pensa City would take 13 days. The comrade smiled and told everyone it would only take half the time. June dismissed her, pointing out the clear markers on the map. With a touch of sarcasm, the comrade informed him that if he could figure out the route, he would have already destroyed the compass in the past. It turns out that the reason why this organization had stood for hundreds of years was that everything had happened beyond the witch hunter's expectations. For the upcoming journey, the comrade was appointed to protect Haniwa as they followed Voss to Pensa City. Clearly, Haniwa seemed to look down on her, while Voss hurriedly stopped his foolish daughter. And so the group of five set off on their continued journey. Meanwhile, Kofun wandered around the city of Pensa for a while, trying to find out where his mother had gone. But in the end, he could only return to his residence in disappointment. Just as he was about to have some quiet time to himself, he was interrupted by a visitor. It was none other than his aunt, Queen Kane, who had come for a hug. Lord Harlan had just married Magra during the day and was already thinking about sharing the bridal chamber with her at night. At first glance, there seemed to be nothing wrong. However, as soon as Magra entered the room, she reminded him that this isn't a marriage, it's an alliance. It seems this marriage was merely a formality. When Magra touched Harlan's bare thigh, she scolded him to put on his smelly pants quickly. Now, she needed Harlan's help to infiltrate Trivant and rescue Voss and Haniwa. So with her newly acquired connections, she thought of Harlan's brother. They went to an outdoor tavern and woke up his hungover brother. After explaining the situation, the brother, eager to please his new sister-in-law, readily agreed, not knowing the dangers of Trivant were beyond their imagination. In this blind world, without technology, Megra and Kofun had no way of knowing that Voss had already escaped. After leaving the camp, Voss and his party had been traveling for several days. Perhaps due to old injuries from Trivant, Voss was feeling physically weak. Upon hearing his plea for help, Paris hurried to his side and diagnosed Voss was running a high fever. If not treated in time, he might die before reaching Pensa City. Voss wanted to persevere, but he couldn't withstand everyone's persuasion and decided to seek help from the nearby Valir tribe. However, June refused to go because he once led his troops to torture members of the Valir tribe. Hearing this, Voss ordered him to stay put while they went in search of the tribe, planning to return later and continue the journey together. June remained silent, appearing somewhat out of sorts. Meanwhile, Kofun experienced his first romance in life. His aunt, who asked for a hug, shakily reached out to touch his muscles. The queen couldn't help but embrace Kofun. Although the hug was innocent enough, those who knew the queen were aware that every move she made was fraught with danger. This 17-year-old young man was still troubled by his mother's actions. Not only had she concealed her princess's identity, but she had also betrayed his father to remarry. Thinking of this, he vented his frustration on his flirtatious aunt, questioning why she had pursued them for so many years. The queen deflected the blame onto Magra in just a few words. She claimed that she had been chasing after Jirlamaral, not Magra. If her sister had come forward sooner, she would have certainly protected her family right away instead of causing harm. Kofun was confused. At this moment, he couldn't tell which of his mother's words over the past 17 years were true and which were false. However, one thing he was sure of was that his aunt seemed genuine and reassuring. Little did Kofun know that the queen would never accept any child born with sight other than her own. 
Perhaps it was the overly warm atmosphere, but in a bewildering move, the queen kissed Kofun. Under the blazing sun in the wilderness, the group of four arrived at the Valir tribe's territory. Voss in the group soon detected some nearby activity, and his calls were promptly answered. The scene shifted, and the Valir tribe's people were suddenly standing before them. Surprisingly, the leader was the long-separated bow. A reunion with kin is filled with joy, and the tight embrace brought back the warmth and familiarity of long ago. That evening, Voss received medical treatment. Through conversation, it was learned that Bo had become well integrated into the tribe and had started to study the art of healing. Reflecting on the past, Haniwa felt ashamed. She apologized to Bo, admitting that her previous self was too arrogant and her prejudices had hurt her. Bo, harboring no grudges, stepped forward and embraced Haniwa tightly. At that moment, she knew that Haniwa had grown up. On the other side, June had been restless for several nights, haunted by the wails of the souls fallen to his blade. Reflecting on his past life, he realized too many innocents had died by his hand. His loyalty to the queen had resulted in his wife and children drowning in their sleep and his troops losing their families. At a certain moment, June's heart began to change. The next day, Voss, who had left the tribe, found June, who no longer had the cold, murderous look in his eyes, but rather a hidden tenderness. In the days he spent with Voss, he had felt a long-lost sense of humanity. Paris also noticed June's transformation, and under her guidance, June realized that his blood-stained hands could no longer fight for darkness. He resolved to use his remaining strength to help Voss find Magra and expose the Queen. Voss interrupted everyone's thoughts, asking them to get ready to depart. The group of five gathered once again, looking toward the approaching Pensa City, everything ahead filled with mystery. The scene shifts to one man being captured. He is Toad's soldier but tries to defect to the Trivant Kingdom. The commander Edo approaches the man to inquire what value he can offer. The soldier reveals to June that the queen is bearing a child with sight. Edo lets out a chicken laugh, mocking that this intelligence is already outdated. The soldier is shocked. To be without value is akin to a death sentence. The next second, Edo orders him to be taken away for execution, but the soldier shouts that there is more information. Edo decides to listen. The soldier divulges not only is the queen about to have a child with sight, but her sister Magra also has two sighted children who have grown up named Kofun and Haniwa. Edo is stunned by this revelation. It seems he had underestimated the power of the Payan kingdom. The scene shifts to a trivent camp filled with sorrow. Several mothers are lamenting the loss of their sons, who died trying to prevent Voss's escape. Standing on the side is Ren, overwhelmed with guilt. But more guilt-ridden should be Edo. It was his family's vendetta that cost so many lives. Watching the mournful scene, he vows to avenge the blood feud for his father and all his warriors, whatever the cost. Shortly after, in the Trivent Council Hall, Edo secretly meets with a military representative to convey information from Payan, knowing that Payan now has several individuals with sight, including the alliance with Voss and June, a force not to be underestimated. The Queen's sudden blame on Trivent must have a purpose, to stir public outrage and attempt to start a war. In conclusion, they should strike first with an attack on Payan. However, the representative perceives Edo's sound analysis as nothing more than a desire to eliminate Voss and settle his family's long-standing vendetta. He tells Edo that persuading other representatives to initiate a war against Payan is quite unrealistic. Payan is just a feudal relic in the face of mighty Trivant, not worth excessive attention. The focus should remain on the Gannet tribe in the West. Edo, somewhat irritated, questions the representative's view on the rise of Payan. The representative suggests that since most forces are in western Gannet to prevent Payan's attack, they could relocate two armies, but this will take time. In the meantime, they could send an envoy to negotiate with Payan, buying time to mobilize troops. Edo says no more. In his mind, a new plan has already taken root. Magra was with her son again, cradling him as he returned. She cautioned him that in this country, one must always be vigilant, even against her sister. But Kofun revealed the queen had visited, which shocked Magra. She paused, warning him not to trust his aunt, for the queen was beyond his comprehension. Kofun grew angry. He challenged her by saying that she betrayed his father and hid her identity. He asked why she didn't reveal herself sooner and spared them a life of being hunted. But Magra explained that it was all because she understood the queen would not tolerate any seer not born from her. Her actions were to protect her family. Kofun dismissed his mother's justification, arguing that her refusal to let them learn to read indicated a reluctance to let them grow. Heartbroken, Magra insisted it was to keep them safe. 
Magra then mentioned seeking Harlan's help, sending people to infiltrate Trivent. Kofun found it utterly absurd. Magra sighed as her son lost his sense of reason, falling into silence. Days later, in the city of Pensa, the queen, now confident from the political marriage between Harlan and her sister, resumed her haughty demeanor. She was rallying all the cities of the Pyan Kingdom, demanding their elite troops for a campaign to Trivent, seeking justice for the Kanzua Dam's destruction. While in the Trivent Kingdom, a strategic decision was made to extend a peace proposal to Payan for the first time. This request quickly reached the city of Pensa, where the queen claimed that Trivent was acting out of fear. She suggested that they had skillfully shifted the blame, interpreting everything as divine protection over their nation. Magra, however, had to overlook her sister's arrogance. She believed that Trivent's display of weakness was no coincidence. It certainly wasn't out of fear of Payan. Although the reason was unclear, she saw it as a prime opportunity to avoid a bloody war and provide the people with an explanation for the damned destruction. The queen, hearing her sister's inclination towards peace, still entertained the idea of going to battle with Trivant. But Magra volunteered to attend the diplomatic summit. She saw it as a chance to put an end to the queen's deception. Before leaving, the queen instructed her to ensure Trivent would apologize and make a substantial compensation for the destroyed dam. Magra could only respond with a bitter smile, because she believed that Trivent wouldn't be foolish enough to admit to such fabricated accusations. Magra looked at her perplexing sister, a plan forming in her mind. Meanwhile in Trivant, Edo was plotting his own scheme. Across from him, Ren listened intently. He intended for her to attend the Payan summit and then carry out an assassination at night to provoke a war. Such actions would amount to treason. Yet to Ren, Edo was like a father figure. His word was her command, even if it meant avenging personal grievances and stifling Payan's rise to power. The only difficulty was that the representative attending the summit was Haniwa's mother. After a several days' journey on foot, the party of Voss finally arrived at the city of Pensa. Unlike in Trivant, they entered the city center with ease. Upon arrival, they split into three groups. Paris and the comrade stayed behind, while June sought out his supporters. Voss and Haniwa went to find Magra. Guided by his daughter, Voss located the tallest building, deducing that the royal family must be inside. After dispatching a few minor guards, the father and daughter burst through the doors, ready to clear the room. A fierce scuffle ensued. Hearing the commotion, Magra came down and recognized her beloved had arrived. Just as Voss was having a reunion with his family, Harlan disrupted the warmth with his provocative words, saying awkwardly that he married his wife. Voss, not knowing the reason, was ready to throttle Harlan on the spot. Fortunately, Magra held him back just as the situation was about to spiral out of control. It was then that the queen emerged from behind, breaking the tension. She invited Voss to dinner, suggesting they could talk things over at the table. Surrounding the dining table, Voss had no appetite. His mind was filled with puzzles and rage. To make matters worse, he was stung by the queen's mockery. The queen taunted Voss about his past as a slave trader in Trivant, yet he had managed to marry a princess, a reference to Magra. Lord Harlan quickly chimed in, taking the opportunity to ridicule Voss's past. Voss would have lashed out if not for his wife and child. Thankfully, Magra intervened in time to defuse the situation, which was almost like a double act between the Queen and Harlan. During the awkward meal, the Queen brought up the news of Magra attending the summit. Voss burst out, telling Magra that the people of Trivent would never bow down, nor would they accept peace so easily. He believed this was undoubtedly a trap, likening it to a banquet where betrayal was planned, and it was uncertain if one could return safely. Magra stood by her beliefs, thinking Voss was overreacting. Voss rose in anger and flipped the table, scattering the food. Magra returned to her room and explained everything in detail to Voss. All her actions had been to protect her family. Voss said that now that they were safe, they could leave, take their child and return to a life in the mountains, far from the corrupt city. However, Magra said that they couldn't leave yet because of her father's dying wish, and the guilt over the tragedy at the dam compelled her to stay and bring down her sister to prevent similar catastrophes from happening again. Hearing this, Voss realized that his wife had become wild-hearted. Magra noticed her husband's concern and continued, saying that once everything was settled, she would hand over the royal power to Harlan and then return to the mountains with Voss. Outside the palace, June secretly met with Toad, who had followed him for many years. 
the two conspired to plan the assembly of an army. As time went on, Toad secretly brought Magra to meet with June. Magra was both shocked and delighted to find June still alive. She learned from June that to achieve peace, they must either kill or depose the queen. But this was not an easy task. Magra told him that he only needed to focus on assembling the army. She would take care of the rest. In her heart, June's appearance clearly accelerated her plan to topple her sister. The once peaceful city of Pensa began to experience the fierce tug of war among its major powers, fraught with danger and swirling undercurrents. The scene shifts to Kofun, who has finally received a pardon from the queen. Unexpectedly, Kofun not only forgave his aunt, but also seemed to have developed a strange affection for her. The queen entered Kofun's room, bringing with her a bottle of wine. Once settled, she confessed her loneliness to Kofun and asked if he would listen to her secrets. He kindly inquired what was troubling his aunt. The queen then recounted her story with tears, revealing that she had just lost a child, a devastating blow to her. Yet even more damning was the public scrutiny she was about to face. The conversation shifted as the queen apologized to Kofun, explaining that the massacre at the Alchemy village was never her intention, and that it was all because she couldn't find her sister, leading to the tragedy. With her smooth talk, she befuddled Kofun, leaving him in a daze. The queen's cooing voice under the influence of alcohol left Kofun somewhat lost. Suddenly, the queen's hand made its way to Kofun's thigh, sending a thrilling sensation that made him lose control of himself and his raging hormones. Meanwhile, Harlan took a package handed to him by a soldier and felt for the message tied with knots. Upon reading the contents, he collapsed in despair. In a panic, he opened the package and as the message had indicated, inside was his brother's severed head. Paris, the top censor, suddenly wakes from a dream, muttering incessantly. Hearing the noise, Haniwa rushes over to ask what's wrong. Paris tells her that the meeting Magra is attending is riddled with conspiracy and they must act quickly to stop it. Haniwa hastily makes her way to the city's stables. She needs to catch up with her mother and convey Paris's prophetic message. Skillfully mounting a Ferrari horse, Haniwa then hurries away from the city of Pensa. In the frontier lands, the envoy team of the Paian Kingdom marches on. Harlan, representing the negotiations, drowns his sorrows in alcohol, still immersed in the grief over his brother's death. Magra, on the other hand, advises him to cease, for this diplomatic mission cannot afford the slightest mistake. After all, the fates of thousands lie in their hands. Voss, well aware of Trivant's strength, has also followed and is silently trailing behind. The team crosses a thawing wilderness and finally arrives at the meeting point between the two nations. On one side is Payan, and on the other is Trivant, both nations poised for their first peace talks in a century. As per the diplomatic rules accepted in the blind world, participants are forbidden from carrying weapons during the talks. Everyone lines up to be searched. Once cleared, each person takes a white cane and then waits for further instructions. Just at this moment, Haniwa arrives in time before the talks begin. She conveys Paris's prophecy, urging everyone to call off the discussions. But with tensions high, leaving now could trigger a war. The only option is to be more vigilant and strengthen their guard. In the city, Kofun sought out Toad and asked him to teach him how to fight. It was unusual for Kofun to suddenly change. It turns out that before Magra left, Kofun had sought out his father, asking him what he thought of his mother's actions. Voss said that everything was done to protect everyone, and he understood Magra's behavior. Kofun asked what they should do next, and whether they should continue to be caught in the middle with Harlan. Voss replied that none of that mattered. The important thing was that they were together again. Feeling his father's hardships, Kofun felt distress and silently resolved to protect his family. Kofun sparred with Toad and lost. Getting up, Kofun asked him why his attacks were always neutralized. Toad told him to listen carefully to the opponent to achieve unity of knowledge and action. Then, he handed Kofun a handkerchief, asking him to forsake his sight and rely on his feelings instead. Kofun hesitated, but eventually blindfolded himself. In less than three seconds, Toad made him surrender. From his performance, Toad thought Kofun did quite well. After a nerve-wracking session where Kofun dodged four out of five attacks, it seemed that pain could indeed trigger potential. Toad was pleased with his performance and declared an end to the day's training. At the diplomatic summit, heavy snow began to fall over the venue. Important officials from both countries sat inside a tent. The commander from Trivon got straight to the point, saying he'd heard that the queen wanted to attack his country. He asked if they would be qualified. He stated that they did not wish for war or to slaughter them like ants. With peace in mind, he requested a reasonable explanation from Payan regarding the queen's actions. 
Sensing the opponent's arrogant accusation, Magra was not to be outdone. She said there was no need for an explanation. They had destroyed their palace and massacred the people, which was a fact witnessed by the queen herself. Furthermore, the recent encroachment on territories was a serious violation of the agreed-upon maps. The representatives engaged in a fierce battle of words, wrestling their tongues but not muscles. But outside, Haniwa was filled with joy because she knew her partner was inside. Voss seemed somewhat relieved, possibly because his daughter had fallen for a woman, his son had fallen for his aunt, or that his wife was married to a new husband. Through the dialogue, it's apparent that Payan is aware of their lack of justification. They suggest that a simple apology from Trivant would suffice, with no need for compensation. This would not only avert war, but also provide an explanation to their people. However, Trivant replied that they would not apologize for something they didn't do. They had always been transparent and righteous. Even the beheading of a Payan spy was openly disclosed, with the decapitated head politely sent back. Harlan suddenly stood up, his anger palpable as he stormed over and beat the speaker from Trivant. The arrogance of someone who had killed his own brother was too much to bear. However, his actions had plunged the situation into a deadlock. That evening, Harlan informed Magra that the day's negotiations were just a formality. In reality, he had already contacted the Trivant commander and was planning to hold a private negotiation that night. Magra was astonished at Harlan's cunningness. It turned out that Harlan had always been in collusion with Trivant because some matters couldn't be discussed openly. Later, Harlan took Magra to the secret meeting place. The Trivant commander began by apologizing to Harlan, admitting that the killing of his brother was an unforeseen tragedy. Harlan got straight to the point. The ensuing candid conversation made it clear that Trivant's triangular council desired peace. Their willingness to compromise was primarily due to the threat from the Gannet tribe to the west. In comparison, Payan's threat was negligible. Naturally, Trivon didn't want to waste energy on this and didn't care about being falsely accused by Payan. Furthermore, Magara assured Trivon that she would soon take over, and with Queen Cain no longer in power, she would make efforts for peace between the two nations, ensuring that such absurd incidents would never happen again. With Harlan's mediation, Trivant expressed their satisfaction and both parties reached an agreement. On the following day, the two countries sat down together again. Before the meeting concluded, the commander issued a warning. If Payan persists in nullifying the decree protecting the sightless, it would pose a threat to the world of the blind. Therefore, Trivant would never stand idly by. This statement was a wake-up call for Magra. She realized that the so-called peace was only temporary. This round of talks was also unexpectedly revealing for Ren, who realized that the assassination plan needed to be put on hold. In Pancha City, the queen invited Kofun to dine. She then called for a servant to bring a cup of a substance banned even in the world of the blind. Under her encouragement, Kofun took a taste, followed by the queen herself. Within minutes, sounds became ethereal to Kofun's ears, and the queen's figure turned hazy to his eyes. Kofun was completely ensnared, and the scene descended into indecency. The scene shifts to Ren, who possessed a rare gift of sight despite her parents being blind. Humanity had lost sight hundreds of years ago. Nevertheless, human vices did not disappear with the loss of vision. The blind were not spared from the struggles for power and the plundering of territories. After the peace negotiation, Ren, hiding somewhere at night, retrieved a weapon from a loaf of bread. Looking at the dagger, she was torn between the orders of Edo and her lover's mother. The undecided Ren stepped out of the tent just as her lover Hanawa appeared. They went up to a high place together. Ren confronted her about why she kept the royal information from her. Haniwa revealed that she too only learned of her mother's identity later on and was surprised to find herself a part of Payan's royalty. Their reunion joy was marred by their heavy hearts. Yet Ren trusted Haniwa and shared her mission, saying that even if they didn't act tonight, war would eventually come to target the envoys, because no one could stop Edo's plans to start a war. Haniwa interrupted her worries, took her hand, and gazed at her lovingly. In that moment, Ren forgot all about her mission and the impending war, as nothing was as sweet as the tenderness and affection they shared then. That night, two assassins infiltrated the camp, agile and ruthless, killing their targets without sight. Clearly, these were no regular troops, but well-trained special forces. A faint noise awoke Voss from his sleep, but by the time he checked, most envoys were already dead. He tackled one assassin while the other took the chance to kill the last commander. Desperate cries alerted Voss to the incursion, but it was too late. 
Ren arrived, furious at what she saw, blaming Voss for everything that happened, and Haniwa must have known as well. She believed that Haniwa had taken advantage of her. Helpless, Haniwa watched Ren walk away, wondering who was responsible for the chaos. Magra arrived, frantically searching the assassin's body, and to her horror, found Payan's mark. Clearly, the queen orchestrated this night. Elsewhere, the queen lay with Kofun, sound asleep like two pigs. Kofun, upon waking and seeing the carnage, fled the bedroom. The queen smiled smugly, but her happiness wouldn't last long as an enraged Magra was on her way back. Soon, Voss's people would return to Pancha City. The queen sensed her sister's approach. Before she could greet her, Magra overturned the queen's meal. The queen continued to eat as if nothing had happened, believing she was in control. At the same time in Trivant, Ren reported to her master, Edo, who didn't blame her, but wondered why Ren alone had survived the carnage. Ren knew her secret couldn't be hidden any longer. She approached him to fit the pieces of the puzzle he couldn't solve for years and revealed that she could see. Both Edo and Queen Cain thrive on chaos and are hell-bent on sparking a war between Trivant and Payan. Due to their respective purposes, what would have been a successful negotiation was sabotaged, and the war horns sounded the march of inevitable conflict. In the city of Pensa, the queen is smugly discussing the impending war. Her enigmatic confidence alone suggests that victory is assured for Payan. After a stirring speech, she declares war against the Trivant and begins directing her divisions to prepare for battle. Just then, Magra confronts her. The queen demands to know what her sister wants. Magra retorts that they will not fight for her. The queen asserts they are her soldiers. However, June strides in, saying that the army is his. The queen is taken aback, and then June exposes her lies. The crowd erupts upon hearing that the queen herself destroyed the Kanzua Dam. Realizing her deceit is uncovered, all that remains for the queen is struggle. She orders the soldiers to seize June, yet no one responds. With two strikes on the ground by June, soldiers outside the palace chant in unison. June approaches the queen and everyone starts moving, aligning themselves behind him. The queen attempts a final, desperate plea, turning to her sister for help. However, Magra confirms everything June has said. In a fury, the queen grabs her sister and yells for the soldiers to arrest all the traitors. At this point, the silent Harlan speaks up, informing the queen that the army of Pensa only obeys Magra. The queen roars like a goose that she is their rightful ruler, but Harlan continues, revealing he has witnesses from the dam who can prove the queen's dishonesty. With that, June draws his long sword, ready to execute the queen. However, Paris intervenes. According to the nation's laws, a pregnant mother cannot be sentenced to death. The child must be born before punishment can be administered. Hearing this, June orders his soldiers to detain the queen. As everyone was preparing to continue their war discussions, a prolonged alarm sounded. The fortress of Pensa City had been breached, something no one saw coming. Before Pensa City was even battle-ready, the formidable Triven army was almost upon them, having taken the Pensa Fortress with ease and no casualties. The Great Army would arrive at Pensa City. Looking at the current defenses, it was clear Payan couldn't withstand a single blow. After some deliberation, a fortress, with its hard-to-attack passages, was considered as a site where the Payan could try to halt the enemy and offset the differences in numbers and equipment. However, the current intelligence suggests Trivant might possess seers, making even the best-laid ambushes in advantageous terrain difficult to conceal. Upon hearing this, Haniwa and Kofun volunteered to join the fight, but Voss rejected their request. In his eyes, sight only fostered a blinding overconfidence that skewed true judgment. This wasn't war, it was a massacre. Haniwa and Kofun still resolved to go. With no other option, Voss turned to Magra for help, but Magra hesitated. Voss wanted to take the children away from there, but everyone disagreed. Magra felt the children had grown up and their wishes should be respected. This infuriated Voss, who knew all too well the horrors of the conflict. Taking the children would be a death sentence. He could not allow such a tragedy to happen and questioned if anyone could bear responsibility for their deaths. Magra slapped him, stating that since war had come, they had no choice but to fight and win. However, Voss was still convinced that this was a losing battle. He could die, but not his children. Yet no amount of talking would do. Magra was already bewitched. On the other side, Kofun found the imprisoned queen who seemed to be enjoying herself rather than appearing forlorn like a typical captive. As the truth unveiled, Kofun realized the queen had manipulated his emotions and used his body to her advantage. 
Sensing Kofun's thoughts, the queen reached for the iron chains that bound her, tore them off and handed them to Kofun, challenging him to end her life, the life of his child's mother. Kofun was dumbfounded, his anger boiling over, he couldn't bring himself to harm her. Instead, he pushed the queen down, overwhelmed by pain. The queen remained composed. She seemed to have a grasp on his psyche. She revealed to him that she was carrying his son, the future of Payan, and that she would reclaim her throne with the birth of their child. Kofun, in a fit of rage, pinned the queen's sexy body down, exclaiming that once the child was born, they would kill her, leaving the child an orphan. The queen responded that her child would not be an orphan, but a prince's son, implying that if Kofun abandoned their child, he would be no different from Yerlamarel. This comparison struck a nerve in Kofun, and he fled in a panic, likely regretting his actions. The scene shifts to Voss feeling his way to the armory, determined to fight for his wife's wishes, despite knowing the slim chances of victory. Guided by touch, he found a dagger and a suit of golden armor. He then began sharpening his blade when June came by, asking Voss why he chose to fight for Payan. Voss explained that it wasn't for the country, but for Magra, for his family. June remarked that he too once had a family, now lost to the queen's cruelty. Sensing June's sorrow, Voss offered his condolences. June then inquired about Voss's perspective on the war. Voss revealed that the opposing side was led by his own brother Edo, and no matter the outcome, he would lose. June was struck by the realization that Voss, who had been hunted for 17 years, was not only a formidable warrior but also a man with a piercing understanding of human nature. The two shared a sense of mutual respect. Despite the seemingly inevitable defeat in the war, neither of them believed it. No matter the odds, they were determined to win. Meanwhile, Ido had learned of the coup in the kingdom of Payan. Given the strengths of Voss and June, he feared that the seemingly certain victory might be jeopardized. Thus, he sought the services of an assassin. His plan was to secretly eliminate Magra. By doing so, he believed that the Payan army would have their faith shaken, crumbling their combat effectiveness from within. Just as Edo had surmised, Magra would go to the battlefield, but would remain in the city of Pensa. Initially, Magra had intended to prepare for battle, but was dissuaded by June. On the battlefield, the queen's presence in the fight wouldn't be inspiring, and worse, if blood was spilled to protect her, it would significantly reduce the army's fighting spirit. Instead, it was deemed better for her to deliver a morale-boosting speech before the troops marched. June was right, and Magra heeded his advice. Led by Harlan, Magra climbed to a high point. After a bell toll, Pensa City fell into an eerie silence, and then Magra began her speech. In terms of delivery, Magra was every bit as eloquent as her sister, but her style was different. She touched on the interests of the family as well as those of the nation. Each word was filled with warmth and power. She declared their strength, asserting that no one could ever bring them down. Even though they knew they were up against the formidable Trivant, in that moment they were filled with confidence. Paris found Voss and embraced him. She implored him not to be merciful, even if the opponent was his own brother. Voss knew what had to be done. Then he instructed Paris to find Toad and secretly carry out an important task. The troops soon began their departure. Magra found the two children and made her final farewells. Then she embraced Voss and pleaded with her husband to return alive. After the main force had left, only Magra and Harlan remained in the city of Pensa. Paris, who had received her mission, found Toad working at the rear. He was complaining about the simplicity of his tasks. Paris informed him that there was something far more significant for them to undertake. Toad agreed, and together they set off on their mission. That night, Edo's assassins had quietly infiltrated the city. The commotion outside awoke Magra, and the unusual atmosphere alerted her to the danger. An assassin crept into the room not realizing that Magra was already poised for an attack. In the blink of an eye, the assassin was countered and killed by Magra. Another assailant lunged, overwhelming Magra with his superior strength. At this critical moment, Harlan arrived just in time, but he was no match for the intruder, who evaded his sword and pinned him to the ground. Regaining her senses, a fierce Magra rejoined the fray. She managed to grasp a weapon. With just one strike, she ended the fight. The threat eliminated, Magra hurried to check on Harlan. Fortunately, he was not grievously harmed. It was indeed a moment where adversity revealed true companionship. On the other side, the Pensa army, led by June, arrived in force at the frontline fortress. They needed to swiftly prepare their positions and ambushes before Trivant arrived. The gorge was easy to defend but hard to attack. The narrow trenches would force the Trivant army to bunch up. Voss realized that the location was better than he had imagined. The advantageous terrain made him believe they had a fighting chance. 
Time flew by, and a long whistle alerted Voss that the enemy was at their doorstep. June called for the scouts to estimate the enemy's numbers. After careful observation, they concluded that the enemy force was more than double the size of their own from Payan. This was destined to be a hard-fought battle. The scene shifts back to Trivent. The grand army of a thousand soldiers was on the brink of war. Just then, Haniwa spotted Ren, and she saw her too. Haniwa put down her bow and arrows and ran towards her. She told Ren that the massacre during the diplomatic talks was the doing of Queen Cain, pleading with her to stop the war. Ren was in a difficult position, knowing he could not change Commander Edo's mind. Haniwa continued to explain that Queen Cain had been deposed and that now her mother was the new queen, hoping Trivant would reassess the relationship between the two nations rather than wage war. At that moment, the Trivant soldiers behind drew their bows. Ren urged Haniwa to run back. As she had expected, nothing could stop the war at this point. A barrage of fiery arrows whistled through the air and a slaughter began. June and Voss were desperately running. Once everyone was inside, the soldiers quickly shut the gates and the tide of arrows finally came to a halt. The first wave of attack was so intense that everyone took cover in the trenches. With a command from Edo, the mighty army of Trivant began their assault on the rebels' last stronghold, heralding the start of a war between two nations. Inside the gorge, June ordered his soldiers to prepare for defense. Voss was worried. The recent volley of arrows indicated that Trivant's strength exceeded his estimates. Voss ordered his two young children to return to Pensa City immediately, but Haniwa protested that she was the only archer in the army, while Kofun dismissed the danger as a piece of cake. Hearing their determination, Voss agreed to let them have their way. Trivant quickly approached the fortress. Under Ido's command, the soldiers hefted a metal battering ram. With each thunderous strike, the gates began to wobble. It was only a matter of time before they'd be breached. Sensing the enemy bearing down on the gate, June gave the order to ready themselves for the onslaught to come. At the same time, the city of Pensa was fraught with barely concealed tension. Magra sat at the bed's edge, listening to her sisters mocking in silence. But soon, unable to bear her sister's shameless comments, Magra interrupted her, asking her whose child she was actually carrying. Queen Kane just laughed at the question. She shamelessly declared that it's Kofun's. Magra had already guessed the truth, but when her sister confirmed her fears, she was devastated. She wanted nothing more than to kill her monstrous sister. She warned her sister not to get too attached to the child because as soon as he was born, he would be taken away, and then the queen would be killed. Hearing this, the queen grabbed her sister and hissed that she would come back as the real queen eventually. Magra, undeterred, shoved her away, vowing that she would see her buried in chains. The scene shifts back to the gorge, where the resounding clang of the iron door still echoes through the mountains. At this moment, Voss catches a faint sound amidst the continuous pounding. He hears the growing number of footsteps drawing near. Indeed, Paris and Toad have successfully completed their mission. They had gone for reinforcements. From the approaching steps, one could tell that the warriors numbered at least a hundred. Haniwa and Kofun rushed out, and to their surprise, they saw the long, absent bow. Voss followed close behind, welcoming and saluting all the arriving warriors. Paris informed Voss that not only warriors from Bo's Valir tribe had come, but also from many other tribes. This showed that Voss's reputation was legendary among the secluded mountain tribes. Though they numbered just a few hundred, their joining would significantly increase the chances of victory in the upcoming battle. Kofun spotted his mentor Toad and hurried over to greet him. Sensing Kofun's brimming confidence, Toad was reassured but warned him that Trivant's men, clad in leather armor and wielding steel blades, had no visible weaknesses. One had to listen with the heart to find the direction of a deadly attack. Kofun expressed his admiration after the advice. It was clear that Toad's guidance was invaluable to him. Meanwhile, Trivant's soldiers continued to ram the gate, the reverberating sounds striking at everyone's hearts. Voss stood at the center of the crowd, ready to give the final rally before the battle commenced. Voss gave an impassioned speech, telling everyone that although Trivant's weapons were superior and their numbers greater, they fought for enslavement and greed. In contrast, the people of Payan fought for freedom and sovereignty. Voss continued, saying that as a father, he chose to let his children go to war, not because he did not cherish his family, but to protect them. He believed everyone present would do the same, fight on until the end. Voss's fiery oration inspired the warriors, and a powerful belief spread among the crowd. Edo, sensing his brother's words, couldn't help but admire the natural leadership and heroic demeanor. Now, the Payan warriors were full of fighting spirit, having cast aside their earlier fear. 
Under Voss's strategic command, the soldiers opened the city gates. They were about to lure Trivant into the gorge, where they would use the trap set by June to initiate a defensive strategy. Ren was puzzled when she saw the gates seemingly fall apart without being attacked. Edo then sent in the first wave of troops for a test of their mettle. The first soldier groped his way forward, unaware that Voss had long been waiting behind the door. With a swift and fluid motion, the enemy's face was instantly cleaved in half. On the other side, June's attacks were just as fierce as Voss's. The next soldiers who tried to follow the sound were taken down by Kofun, who swooped down and with a single stroke decapitated the intruders. This didn't scare off the enemy, however, and a second wave of soldiers began their advance. Haniwa got up from behind, drew her bow and shot arrows, followed by her fellow warriors who threw a barrage of iron spears in the same direction. The enemy troops entering the fray were all quickly eliminated, yet Edo, seemingly fearless of death, didn't care. Wave after wave of his soldiers kept pushing forward. With Haniwa's sharp-eyed command, the attacks of Paiyan were overwhelmingly successful, leaving no enemy survivors. Soon, the gate was piled high with bodies, and seeing they couldn't break through, Edo deployed the crossbow vanguard squad. Under the command of children with sight, they adjusted their angles for precise targeted strikes. As Payan soldiers continued to fall, a large enemy force surged into the gorge. Voss raised his knife, found the prepared rope, and cut it down. The massive impact and screams made everyone's heart tremble. Enraged, Edo ordered a full assault to take down the gates. At his command, Trivant's mighty army began to overpower the city, a tide of enemies flooding in. What seemed to be a dire scene actually played right into Payan's defensive trap. Voss led the charge, wielding his weapon with style, and a massacre officially began. Haniwa provided long-range arrow cover. Voss and his men fought with full force, avoiding any sneak attacks. Kofun cut down the enemy, coordinating perfectly with the tribal warriors. As the battle intensified, June gave a secret signal. Voss followed the sound. The two dragged a wounded soldier into the tunnel, using his screams to attract more enemies. A large number of soldiers rushed to the sound, unaware they were heading straight into a trap. Bags filled with fuel hung ready. The two spread the fuel as they moved deeper into the tunnel. Before long, they reached the end of the passage, with enemy troops still approaching in large numbers. Voss found the prepared fire source, but the fire was knocked to the ground. Hearing the situation, June had no choice but to re-enter the fray, fighting off the enemy to buy Voss time to ignite the fire. Within the gorge, the battle had reached a fever pitch. Edo wielded a heavy weapon, cutting down enemies one by one with such force that it struck terror into the hearts of all who heard. In other areas, the tunnel skirmishes were just as bloody. The tribal warriors hurled spiked hammers with deadly accuracy, instantly splattering the brains of their foes. The clashing of swords, the piercing screams of pierced flesh, for a moment filled the sky. Perched above, Haniwa saw her golden opportunity. Edo was in range, and she drew her bow to shoot. In the nick of time, Ren stepped in front of her, pleading for Haniwa's mercy. It was just a second's hesitation. Haniwa was tackled and seized. Both of them, looking into the eyes of their beloved, felt a helplessness fill their hearts. On the other side, June was still hard-pressed. Finally, Voss managed to create a spark. In an instant, the enemy's wails of agony rose. The spreading fire followed the tunnel, blazing all the way to the entrance. Ren quickly tackled June, narrowly avoiding disaster. Edo had never anticipated that Payan could be so formidable. Clearly, he had underestimated the combined strength of Voss and June. Without delay, Edo led Ren on a bloody path to carve out an escape. He needed to rethink his battle strategy. He ordered the crossbow team to attack again. Trivant's crossbow squad moved forward. From the number of falling warriors, it was clear that Trivant's boy had been well-trained, calm, and composed. Kofun knew they had to capture the boy to neutralize the threat, so he climbed to a higher vantage point, prepared to pounce to the sound. With a swift leap, he captured the boy. Yet he did not deal a deadly blow. Instead, he started clearing the soldiers around him. The sharp blade pierced their bodies, and Kofun relished the thrill of his near-death experience. However, the enemy that arrived after threw him to the ground. Just as Kofun was about to meet his end, Toad arrived just in time. Though the immediate crisis was averted, the waves of enemies that kept coming were a real nuisance. 
Surrounded and outnumbered by Trivant's relentless men, Toad and Kofun were hard-pressed. In the melee, Toad was stabbed through with a sword. By the time Kofun got to him, Toad was on his last breath. He ultimately died on the battlefield, lying in his disciples' arms. Trivant's relentless attacks were gradually overpowering Payan. Voss led his people in a desperate struggle, but they were still no match for the overwhelming numbers of the enemy. It was only a matter of time before Trivant would conquer the fortress. According to the contingency plan, Voss decided to initiate the final step. At June's command, all Payan warriors began to retreat. However, when they reached their destination, they found themselves at a dead end, surrounded by sheer cliffs. Voss shed his heavy leather armor and grasped his long knife, probing the cliff face. After a quick search, he found a rope with a stone tied to the other end. Exerting all his strength, it was clear he intended to pull down this massive boulder. Voss pulled desperately. At the sound of a horn, everyone stopped fighting and retreated to the cliff edge. Just then, numerous ropes were thrown down from above, showing that the allied warriors had arrived atop the cliffs. Ren, witnessing this, was struck by an ominous premonition. Once everyone had a firm grip on the ropes, Voss gave a mighty pull and the boulder crashed down. It turned out they were standing over a frozen lake, and the boulder's purpose was to break the ice layer, plunging the lured Trivent forces into the icy waters below, thus capturing the remaining enemies in one fell swoop. Ren crouched down hastily, grasped Voss's intent, and shouted a retreat. But the ice's chain reaction cracked faster than people could react. Act. Voss glided and leaped across the ice flows, quickly reaching the cliff edge. Ren, on the other hand, was in grave danger. Despite her desperate retreat, she couldn't escape the disaster. Ren's cries for help abruptly ended, plunging Edo into an abyss of despair. At that moment, he felt as though a father had lost his daughter, a wave of sorrow piercing his heart. He could never have imagined that he would face defeat in this battle. The scene changes to reveal Ren miraculously escaping death, emerging from the water's surface. The gorge, littered with bodies, presents a scene of eerie silence that sends shivers down the spine. Voss calls out for Haniwa and Kofun. Fortunately, Haniwa is safe and sound. She informs her father that Kofun is also fine. With this news, Voss can finally rest easy. It's at this moment that he hears a familiar whistle. Even from miles away, Voss instantly recognizes the call as coming from his brother Edo. He knows that the long-standing feud between them must ultimately come to an end. In the snow-covered landscape, Edo stands in the middle of the bridge, whistling a tune that only the two of them know. He suddenly stops, realizing that Voss has already arrived. Edo sheds his leather armor and weapons, declaring his intent to have a final showdown with his brother. Voss feels a sense of inevitability. His brother is single-mindedly seeking vengeance for their father, never trusting in Voss's true intent. Edo suddenly attacks, charging towards the sound and scooping up Voss in a wild collision. Voss rolls with the motion, dissipating the force and emerging unscathed. Then the two slowly close in on each other. From the moment they make contact, the two unleash their martial prowess, each blow landing with force. After a fierce exchange, neither can gain the upper hand. Voss throws a handful of leaves, using them as a distraction while he executes a sliding step to trip his brother. Edo rises in pain and lowers his head for another wild charge. Voss's hand, sharp as a blade, strikes upward at the throat. Edo grabs his brother again, then pulls on the arm and hammers it towards his waist. The attack doesn't stop. He lifts Voss and body slams him to the ground, a series of deadly moves that leave Voss unable to rise. Edo then walks over to his equipment and retrieves his weapon. Once again, he stands before his brother saying goodbye to him. Voss rolls to deflect the attack and then uses his feet to lock his arm, reversing the situation. Voss pulls out a small knife and slides it across Edo's cheek. With the slightest pressure, it could all be over, but he can't bring himself to do it. Voss, showing mercy, thinks his brother will be moved to stop the struggle. However, just as he's about to leave, Edo charges again. He pulls out Voss's knife and stabs. Fortunately, it's not a fatal wound. Voss retreats in pain, grabbing the blade in an attempt to pull it out. The long knife ends up stabbing into Edo's stomach, a fatal blow that leaves him without the strength to move. Sensing his brother's fading life, Voss cries out. Despite years of estrangement, his heart has always held a place for Edo, his most loved relative. As Edo lay dying, he revealed the reason for his arrival. He confessed to Voss that returning home after a defeat meant certain death, and seeking refuge with Payan would result in the same fate of being hanged.
Reflecting on his life, the tragic death of their father, and the loss of Ren in battle, Edo admitted that even if he were to survive, his life would be hopeless. He preferred to die a swift death at his brother's hand. Voss couldn't hide his sorrow. Edo comforted his brother, telling him not to be sad because as warriors from childhood, such a death was their destined fate. In the end, he asked Voss one last question, if their father really ordered his death and got the affirmative answer. On the other side, Haniwa arrived at the camp where prisoners were held. There, she encountered a young boy, her half-brother, whose mind seemed far more mature than Haniwa's. Haniwa realized the boy had been brainwashed. Ultimately, she handed him over to her comrade for re-education, to erase his ignorance. Later, Haniwa found Ren covered in scars and her heart ached for her. She then helped her leave the gorge. The two shared a bittersweet parting, reluctant to separate. Despite Haniwa's pleas, Ren insisted on returning to Trivant, as her family was there. Touching the necklace on Haniwa's neck, she asked why she still wore it. Haniwa told her it was because she said that only love could last forever. Moved to tears by her words, Ren cried. Ultimately, Ren chose to depart alone. The Paian kingdom welcomed their triumphant warriors home. Magra called out for her children, hoping to hear their voices. Fortunately, Haniwa and Kofun were unharmed, and the family was finally reunited. That evening, Magra tended to Voss after the hardships he had endured. Afterward, holding her husband, she praised him for protecting their children. Voss corrected her, saying it wasn't him. The children had grown up and learned to protect themselves. The queen was now there for everyone, and Voss was no longer needed. Hearing this, Magra felt her husband's desolation. She understood everything had changed. She could no longer fulfill the promise to return to a simpler life in the mountains with Voss, a wish that seemed destined to remain unfulfilled. Several days later, on a bright morning, Magra held the coronation ceremony for June. She announced that while military ranks were to remain, their duties were to change. Witch hunters were no longer needed in this world, as the return of sight was an unstoppable trend in the world's progression. After the coronation, June stepped into the hall. Facing all the commanders present, he declared that the world had changed. If they could not accept the dissolution of the witch hunters, he would release them from service and allow them to leave freely. Hearing this, nearly half chose to leave the army. This showed that breaking free from centuries-old feudal thinking was still a long road ahead. The war is far from over and all the conspiracies are waiting for a new twist. At this moment, Gerla Morel's other son was brought forward. He was to give one final demonstration for the scientists of Trivant. If unsuccessful, his family would be put in peril. The boy made his way to a thatched hut, which was his target. After making arrangements, he lit the fuse and then doubled back to the scientists, waiting to see the outcome. The bomb had been developed by the people of Trivant. In the glaring sunlight of Pensa City, reality returned. Voss awoke, kissed his wife, and stealthily got out of bed. He went to Haniwa's room and gazed longingly at his daughter. Then he moved to Kofun's room, bending over his son as if to say a final farewell. When Magra woke up, Voss was gone. He had ultimately chosen to leave. Although the war was not over, for him it ended with his brother's death. His wife had cleared the way, and Haniwa and Kofun were capable of standing on their own. No one needed his protection anymore. Staying would only draw him into struggles for power and entangled emotions. The Kane sisters and the death of Edo made Voss realize that power would inevitably lead to betrayal and enmity. Now, with his wife bound by the prestige of Harlan, Voss knew that everything had become uncontrollable. Everyone was drifting away from him. For him now, perhaps the only solace was to return to the wilderness. That might be the best place for him. And with that, the second season comes to a close. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.